talking about has to take place. You gotta get in the fire. You gotta get in the fire, amen? <laughs> Look at the person next to you and say, I don't want that. <laughs> That's how people usually are. They'll say, I don't want any of that. But, guess what? You want God to do something in your life and in this country in which we live, we're already in the fire. That's right. Yeah. Come on. Like it or not, we're already in the fire. Uh, the chaplain came by and he's going to be at the church here today uh, to stop and talk to us. And uh, he asked me if I knew anyone that did same-sex marriages. No. And uh, I said, uh, no, I do not know anyone. I said, that's not the crowd I hang with. He said, well, that's not the crowd I hang with either. But it just came down from the state of Michigan that you'd have to do that as a chaplain, he would have to do same-sex marriages or find someone that will do them. So those are some of the questions that he would probably will ask, answer today for you. What's going on in this world in which we live and why when we go into prison, what we can and cannot do. Just so you know, I'll fill you in on one. You can no longer hug a prisoner. That's right. You can no longer hug them, so you got that one already. So you, that's one that he's going to show you. But anyhow, I want you to stay after you say, well, I'm hungry, Pastor. I'm so hungry. I'm so hungry. We've got some sandwiches for you. You will not starve, okay? <laughs> we need you to stay after. If you want to get into the prison and you want to do music in the prison or you want to speak in the prison, you have to go through this half hour, 40 minutes right after church. So you have to do that. Everybody say, I know that now. I know that now. You can't get out of it. You have to go through this, okay? So today what I'd like to share with you though is called looking for a deal or have I got a deal for you? And uh, before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. We thank you that the entrance of your word gives light and it gives understanding on each and every one of us. Father, we thank you right now that Jesus Christ is here in the presence of the Holy Spirit to teach us, to guide us, to bring all things to our memory, to receive from you and to show it unto us. Spirit of God, we ask that you would just open up scriptures this morning. Open up our, like we've already sung, open up the heavens. Mm. We want to see you. Yes, we do. Yes. Help us to see Jesus high and lifted up this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 There's a phenomenon that sweeps through the Midwest, June, July, and August, and it's called garage sales. Garage sale. This is a time when you get rid of all those things which you no longer use or find valuable. Sometimes you can clean out your garage with a sale and then you refill your garage with purchases from another garage sale. How many of you ever did that? Okay. Sometimes you get multi-family garage sales. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And then some people have perpetual garage sales. There's some, all you have to do is go down the road, you know there's going to be a garage sale at that house. That's just how they are. Well, I just want you to know that this pastor goes to garage sales. And so does Pastor Mac. He goes to garage sales. And so do a lot of my pastor friends that go to garage sales. Through the years, here's what we purchased. Four matching lawn chairs, bicycles, Lawnmowers. I got a brand new lawnmower one time. I'll never forget. I was coming home from Chrysler's, and uh, the guy had a garage sale, and I was, and he said free. It was a brand new lawnmower. And I said, what do you mean free? This is free. He said, I just had shoulder surgery, and you're the first one here, so you get the lawnmower for free. So I've had that lawnmower 15 years. Still starts first pull. Snow blowers, tools, chainsaws. Microwave and cart. Annie Petschke told us about this garage sale. She, she said, you've got to go there, Pastor. This guy was going to sell all his property, sell everything in the place. They were going to buy a motorhome and go around the world. Man, we got a great microwave and we just replaced it about two years ago. But that was a wonderful thing. <laughs> We've gotten stains, paints, tools. We've gotten brushes, rollers, mini bikes, sports gear, refrigerators, storage trunks footstools, patio sets, we've got it all at garage sales. But our best deal happened over at Dorothy LaVoy's probably about eight, nine years ago. When Joni pulled in the driveway, and her and I had bought all of these VHS, V2, 
videos for one dollar a piece. And she said, honey, come here. I was up on the roof. We were pulling down Dorothy's old garage and putting in, going to be putting in a new garage. And I came down to the car and she said, look at this. She pulled out an envelope out of a Noah's Ark video that we got for one dollar. And there was $623 in the envelope. No, there was no forwarding address on it. No checking account numbers, no savings account numbers, but 623 macaroons. So me being the nice guy that I am, I said, honey, keep 23 for yourself. <laughs> Isn't that good, Bruce? So you keep 23 for yourself, honey, okay? <laughs> That's right. But I read something, and I said, you know, I've got to share this with people. Because, you know, you get some good deals at a garage sale. You really do. But I read this, and I said, you know what, I've got to share that with people. So I'm going to read this article to you this morning. It's entitled, One Man's Junk is Another Man's Treasure. Ready, John? Bob had systematically worked his way to the back of the garage sale and was about to make his exit when he first saw it. Although partially hidden underneath a tablecloth and an old comforter, the shape was unmistakable. It was a motorcycle. And not only that, it was an old motorcycle. It was a Harley. Obviously, it wasn't part of the garage sale, and that piqued Bob's interest. Is that bike for sale, he asked? The man shrugged. Well, I don't rightly really see why not. The wife says everything in this garage has to go, but I'll warn you, that bike hasn't run since I've had it. Motor's seized up. Won't turn over. Could probably buy yourself a new one with what it costs to fix up that old thing. Bob nodded patiently, all the same, how much do you want for that motorcycle? Well, I know they'll give me $35 for it at the scrapyard. How does that sound? Bob looked at the rusty old heap. What would his wife say if he brought it home? Bob, you can identify with this, right? <laughs> oh, if you want to go to American Pickers Place, go to Bob Allen's. He built a big garage and he didn't build it big enough, amen? Now, I mean, it's a big garage and we're going to have an American Pickers breakfast over there one day, but really are. <laughs> okay, he said, I'll give you $35. Can I pick it up tomorrow? Shortly thereafter, the old Harley was occupying space in Bob's garage. After a few weeks of procrastinating, he finally got around to calling Harley Davidson just to see what a few major parts for restoration would run into. He connected with someone on the parts line and he asked a few questions. Why don't you give me the serial number? The dealer said, and I can look that up for you. Bob gave him the number. Hold on just a second while I look it up. Bob waited on hold, listening to the 60s rock station piped into the receiver. How appropriate, he thought. After what seemed an inordinately long time, the parts man returned to the line, and just in time, one more number by the Trogs or Country Joe and the Fish might have driven Bob off the line altogether. Somehow, the Harley man sounded different, strange, self-conscious, like something was up. Uh, sir, I'm going to call you back, okay? Could I get your full name, address, and phone number, please? Why does he need my name and address, Bob wondered. But then again, what was the harm? It's no big deal. He'd probably end up on some motorcycle list. Bob gave the man what he wanted and hung up. However, after a few minutes, he found himself getting nervous. He regretted giving the information about himself over the phone. What if the bike had been involved in a crime of some kind? What if the bike was stolen? Was he in danger of prosecution? Maybe the police were already on their way. Or a hell's angel, ready to get his bike back. <laughs> Bob sweated for a couple of days without hearing back from Harley. But just as his worries were about to uh, subside, the phone rang. This time, however, it wasn't a parts man. Bob found himself talking to a Harley executive. The man seemed overly friendly, making Bob feel even more uneasy. Listen, Bob, said the man, I want you to do something for me, okay? Yeah, well, I guess I will. Bob, I want you to set the receiver down and don't hang up. Take the seat off your motorcycle and see if anything is written underneath. Would you do that for me, Bob? The man talked like an air traffic controller bringing in an off-course 737. And Bob felt like he was about to hit wind shear, but he grabbed the screwdriver, did as he was told, Returned to the phone. Yes, he said, it does have something written there. It's engraved and it says, the king. Listen, is there some kind of trouble here? What's this all about anyhow? 
There was a moment or two of profound silence on the other end of the receiver, but Bob felt like the man in the long distance commercial listening for a pin to drop. Bob, my boss has authorized me to give you $300,000 for that bike. Payable to you immediately. How about it? Do, do we have a deal? <laughs> Bob was so stunned he could hardly speak out. I'll have to think about it, he said. <laughs> he hung up the phone and let himself slump slowly to a sitting position on the kitchen floor. The next day, Bob got a call from Jay Leno, the late night telephone, uh, television retired talk sultan. Leno explained that he had a thing about Harley's and offered Bob $500,000. Uh, I just put in here, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. <laughs> <laughs> the king, of course, was none other than Elvis Presley. That was Elvis oh, wow. Presley's motorcycle. Oh. At a garage sale, the serial number had made that clear, and the engraved legend under the seat had removed all doubt. The bike Bob had redeemed from the scrap pile at a garage sale for $35 as had once been owned by the king of rock and roll. And it was worth half a million at the least. After all those years of seeking the big find at a garage sale, Bob had found it. But he hadn't even recognized what he had. Look at the person next to him and say, you don't even realize what you have. <laughs> it goes to show you that truly one man's junk is another man's treasure. The value of the motorcycle, of course, wasn't in the metal or the parts. It didn't even run. The value had nothing to do with the bike's beauty, what it was made of, or how well it performed. It was all tied to the fact that it had been owned by the king. He had touched it, he had ridden it, taken pride in it. I, as I was reading this, I thought, how much is that donkey worth that Christ rode? <laughs> and the inexplicable value of our culture that has attached to Elvis Presley approaching deity status transferred to his motorcycle. There were people willing to pay a small fortune for the privilege of saying, I own Elvis Presley's motorcycle. Bob didn't realize he had something of great value. He had to clue about the bike's previous owner. He just saw something cheap on the marketplace, an opportunity for a little profit. What he found out, of course, was that ownership was by far the most important truth about that old Harley. In fact, ownership is everything. And what is it that speaks most forcefully about your value in mind? Is our value based on how much money we are worth? I want you to take a turn with me over to Psalm chapter 49. Before I read this last paragraph. Is our value based on what we're made of? Is it based on our job title or economic status? Is it determined by where we live or what house we live in? Or what we can do and what we can't do? What gives us a sense of worth and significance is that I belong to God. I have been redeemed by God's own Son at great suffering and a great price. He owns me. No one argues with the mark of the King upon my life. Wow. I'm a wealthy man this morning. Mm -hmm. Wealthy man, not because I have an Elvis Presley motorcycle in my driveway. I don't have that. Truth, truthfully, I don't even have a Yamaha or a Kawasaki. Mm -hmm. I don't have a Honda. I don't have any of those. I don't even have a mini bike anymore. And the last kid went out, the last <laughs> minibike went out. Amen? But I came across this passage of Scripture. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches. Verse 6, would you read that there? None of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. In other words, I don't care how much money you have, you cannot pay for your brother or sister, aunt, uncle, niece, nephew, neighbor, anybody to go to heaven with how much money you have. You can't do it. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceases forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever. I've often wondered why rich people think like that. 
I'm going to work all I can, make all I can, then try to make some more, then try to establish a franchise and make some more, get another franchise and make some more, get another franchise and make some more. I want to have all this money. Then what? Then what? Well, then I'll have a lot of money. Then I'll be able to travel. Then what? Well, then from there I'll be able to get marry the girl I want. Then what? I, I, thought, I thought it was ironic that Tiger Woods had said to his wife, you'll never marry another billionaire. She married a shipping magnet, made him look like a poverty guy. <laughs> now she's probably, if she divorces him, she'll get double someday. Amen? <laughs> look what takes place here. Verse 8, for the redemption of the soul is precious and it ceases forever, <laughs> that he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he sees that wise men die. <laughs> Likewise, the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Underline that you leave your wealth to who? Others. others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Somebody asked me that about that passage of scripture a number of weeks ago. Where is that passage of scripture found? And here's where it's found in Psalm 49. Is how foolish it is for a person to call your house name after your own. This is Hood's Acres. In 20 years, whose is it going to be? 30 years, whose is it going to be? Just Acres. Just acres. <laughs> you can't take it with you. Nevertheless, man being in honor abides not. In other words, you don't always, people don't always honor you. He is like the beast that perishes. There's going to come a time where you and I are going to die. This their way is their folly or foolishness, yet their posterity approved their sayings. In other words, the children hear this and they start thinking the same way as their parents. That is, I, I gotta make all I can, can all I make, sit on the lid, and that's how it'll be for the rest of my life. Like sheep they are laid in the grave, death shall feed on them, and the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning, and their beauty shall consume in the grave from the dwelling. But God will redeem my soul from the power Amen. of the grave, for he shall receive me. Amen. Be not thou afraid when one is made rich. Underline that. When the glory of his house is increased. For when he dies, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. Though while he lives, the blessed, he, he blessed his soul, and men will praise thee when thou doest well for yourself. In other words, when someone makes a lot of money, we say, man, I'm proud of my son, I'm proud of my daughter, they made a lot of money, I'm so proud of them. Well, People will praise you, but then what? You're going to grow old. He shall go to the generation of his fathers. They shall never see light. Man that is in honor and understands not is like the beast that perish. Is it wrong to have money, Pastor? No. But it's the right attitude is this. That cannot pay for my salvation. Mm -hmm. The most precious thing that I have is Christ in me, Amen. the hope of glory. Amen. Just like that motorcycle was valuable, it was not that it was a Harley Davidson that made it valuable. It was not that it was in good shape that made it valuable. It was not, uh, no, that's not what made it valuable. What, it, what made it valuable is that the king of rock and roll owns it. What makes you and I valuable is that we are... Amen. In, on the inside, greater is he that's in us than mm. he that is in the world. Right. Is we have Jesus Christ mm. on the inside of us. Amen. Take a turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 through 11. I just want you primarily to focus on the on the sixth verse. I'm not going to read the whole passage. Six and seven. For God, who commands the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. 
that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. When I started my Christian walk a number of years ago before I went to Bible school, there was a guy that owned Frank's Barbershop at 15 Mile in Gratiot. And he had become a Christian. And he found out that it was Christ in him, the hope of glory. And uh, he was going to be leaving his church, the Catholic Church at that time. But when he went to talk to the priest, the priest said to him, what has happened to you, Frank? He said, what has happened to you? Because <coughs> Frank was worried about his candle. He was still one of the altar guys, and his candle head went out, and the priest said, Frank, don't worry about that candle. He says, he says, there's enough light on your face to light all the candles that are in this sanctuary right now. When Christ comes on the inside of you, and you see who you are in Christ Jesus, there's not enough money that could ever pay for that feeling on the inside. Mm. I came across this song. You don't hear it too much, Bruce. Maybe you'll why I might play it someday. By the way, that song that you guys played last week, did you know that song was from 1687? I'll show you after church that, that, uh, that song. And uh, the one who wrote those words, it was from 1687. Mm -hmm. We said it's a brand new song, Pastor. <laughs> no, that song is 307 years old. Mm -hmm. I'm going to share it with you after church again. Okay. Nor silver nor gold hath obtained my redemption, nor riches of earth could have saved my poor soul. The blood of the cross is my only foundation, the death of the Savior thou maketh me whole. I am redeemed, but not with silver. I am bought, but not with gold. Remember that song mm -hmm. years ago? Bought with the blood, the blood of Jesus, precious blood of love untold. Mm -hmm. Nor silver nor gold hath obtained my redemption, the guilt of my conscience too heavy had grown. The blood of the cross is my only foundation. The death of my Savior could only, only atone. I am redeemed, but not with silver. I am bought, but not with gold. Bought with the price, the blood of Jesus. The blood of love untold. Nor silver nor gold hath obtained my redemption. The holy commandment forbade me drawn near. The blood of the cross is my only foundation. The death of my Savior removeth my fear. I am redeemed, but not with silver. I am bought, but not with gold. Bought with the price, the blood of Jesus. Precious price of love untold. The whole song is about how valuable it is for a person. How much God had to pay in order for you and I to have the salvation and enjoy the salvation that we have. And we take it so lightly Leonard and I talked a number of years ago about our image, our self-image, and our self-worth. It's all predicated in this world, and the car we drive, the house we live in, the money we have, the clothes we wear, where we go, the restaurants we eat at, and everyone says, well, that must be a wealthy person, that must be a wealthy person because they have all of that. You and I need to start realizing what we have on the inside mm -hmm. of us and start living it out that we are wealthy already, amen? Yeah, yeah. Not trying to find the deal. The deal has already been found. I got a deal for you. You exchange your sin for his righteousness. I exchange my sin for his righteousness. I exchange my poverty for his wealth, amen? I exchange my not knowing where I was going for his knowing everything about me, my past, present, and future. I'm a very wealthy man. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verse 8, it says, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. How many of you ever been there? Troubled on every side, not distressed. We are perplexed. How many of you ever been perplexed? But not in despair. I, it's funny. I, I, I pastor this church. I love this church. But I have a lot of people that will come up and they'll say, Pastor, you're healed. I said, you are. I said, you're healed. That's good. But guess what? The doctors say what? No. I'm not. Okay. Now, I would love, how many of you would love to just have God heal you sovereignly every time? Yep. Even if you get a yellow tooth and it miraculously turns loose white right away. How many of you would like to do that? Look at the person next to you and say, it doesn't happen like, happen like that. A lot of our health issues are predicated on ways we were born. I was sitting at a golf thing the other day, Bill, I, I don't know if you were there, but a young man, um, uh, Ernie, says, Pastor, he said, i got to uh, tell you something. He said, I didn't want to say anything when we were praying a couple weeks ago, 
When he said, you were talking about a birth abnormality, he says, I have a birth abnormality. He said, I was born with a bicuspid valve. He says, not many people are born like that. And I looked at him and I said, Ernie, that's the same kind of valve I have, a bicuspid. That means there's two flaps where there needs to be three, and that's the one they got to fix. They fix it once, but they got to fix it again. He said, oh. He said, I thought I was weird. I said, you are. <laughs> I said, you know how many weird people there are in a country of 327 million people? There's a lot of weird people. But we live in a time where they fix a lot of things. But even then, listen, if I don't make it, I'm still in good shape. Amen. If I don't make it in this world, I'm still in, If I don't have another dollar to my name, my kids are going to look through everything and they're going to say, man, that's all they left us. <laughs> <laughs> it's not about how many, how, many, how many toys you have when you die. That's right. It, but it is about this. Do you have Jesus in your heart when you die? No, that's it. I heard a little story last week. I, I thought it was humorous. This guy had a dream. He saw two angels. And these angels said, listen, you can take one thing to heaven. One thing. Your most valuable thing. He said, well, shoot, I'm a rich man. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to cash in all my assets. I've melted down to gold. Haven't made any gold bars. So he died and he got to heaven. And he said, they said, well, did you bring your one thing? And he said, yeah, here it is. It's in the bag. Pull the bag down, it's gold bars. He said, pavement? You brought pavement? <laughs> Revelation 21, 21 says the streets are paved with gold. Yeah. Yeah. We're all these things we worry about. Yeah. You know what we ought to be worrying about? Dale Moody had this to say. He said, when you look out your window in the morning, he was looking down on Chicago. We were in Chicago a few, a few weeks ago. He looked down and he says, what do you see in the morning? They said, I see people. Say, take another look. They said, I see people. Take another look. He said, I see people. That's all I see is people. He said, you don't see souls? He said, every one of those people are going to hell if they don't know Jesus Christ. Right. Right. What do you see when you go to the store? Oh, I see people. Fat people, thin people, tall people, ugly people, good looking people, rich people. But do you ever stop to think every one of those people have an eternal soul? And you can't, listen, you can't pay their way into heaven. It can't take place. That's why when I say you're rich this morning, the Bible says there is he that makes himself rich but is poor. Mm -hmm. And there is he that makes himself poor yet has great riches. When a missionary, William Carey, left England, they said that there were no Christians in Africa. By the time he got back from Africa, they said there were no unsaved people in Africa because William Carey had went over there. People had looked at him and heard him and said, that's a little guy. He can't, what's he going to accomplish over there? One man, what's he going to do over there? One man with God on the inside of him and the Spirit of God working in him can change a whole area. That's, right. that's what, why the Bible says you have. Everybody say, I have. I have. This treasure. In earth, in earth and dust. You say, oh, but you mean when I go to the factory, the pastor that I'm influential, you better believe it. Yep. You might be the only person in that area that knows Jesus Christ. Right, right. And you're looking at yourself, ah, crummy job, $13 an hour. Crummy job, crummy house, crummy car, crummy, everything's crummy in my life because you said that about yourself. God didn't say that about you. He said, you have this treasure in earth and vessels. We used to sing a song, anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. So let's say you're up on top of a roof, working and putting on roofs, and you say, that's a crummy job. <laughs> Not if God put you up there to talk to someone about Jesus Christ. That's right. You know, I learned a lot of things on the roof. I was helping a guy put a roof on a house one time, and the guy kept splitting this, the nail kept ping, 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 and... I said, what happened? He said, ah, oh, he said, I'm trying to put this nail through a hard spot. He said, every time we get to I'm trying to go through a hard spot, he said, hey, I just got a revelation. When a hard spot comes, we so easily just get distracted and we quit in life. He said, I'm just going to move the nail a little bit. Either that, he said, I'm going to get a drill, but I'm going to go through these tough spots. I got a little revelation here. Look at the person next to you say, hard spots can make you get a little deeper with God. Amen. Amen. Hard spots can make you get a little deeper with God. Yeah. Well, how wealthy are you this morning? 
Take and turn with me to Psalm 19, 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise is simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. We've been having a class in 930 about Americans' heritage. I'll tell you what, that class has got over 60 hours of teaching. The ones who have been showing up are, we're finding out, America. Everybody say America. America. They have pictures of our founding fathers, huge Bibles under their arms. They have all the way through our capitals and that. It's nothing but Christian people there. They, they thought this was the most important thing, the most precious thing they could have outside the knowledge of Jesus Christ in their hearts. You can learn all about that at 9.30, but Pastor, I haven't had my toast yet. Tough. I'll, I'll, I'll fry you some bread on Sunday morning when I get it. But you need to learn about your heritage. Yes, you know why, we, why we're living the life we're living? Because we bought into the world system. That's right. right. We bought into the world system about if you have this, 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 and this, that makes you important. No, what makes you important is you've got the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords on the inside of you. You can change the area in which you live. You can change your family. You can change your world if you start operating on the treasure that's on the inside of you. That's what John said when he said, Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now we have this treasure in us. But until we have it in us and we operate with that knowledge, it never comes out. Oh, I got a 60-inch TV hanging on my wall, Pastor. I go down the road, it's probably another guy got a 72-inch. That's right. Come on. Well, let's go down the road. Someone's probably got an 8-footer hanging someplace. I know one guy has got a little movie theater in the double-wide trailer. He has eight people come over, and he's going to sit in the theater seats and that. And he said, well, and he said, I'll even bring you popcorn. It sounds like the, what the, the Imagine Theaters, yeah. where you can order from your seats. I don't think God wants us ordering from our seats. No. I think he wants us to go out into all the world and preach the gospel yes. to right. every preacher. What do you see? When you go down I-94 in the morning, what do you see, people? Nice cars, best you see the cars. How about the guys that are driving a junkie car, do you still see a soul going to hell? That's right. Come on. <laughs> Take a turn with me over to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. Oh, I look for deals at garage sales. Don't get me wrong. I, I look for deals. But the greatest deal I ever got was at 13 Mile and Ryan's when I had to pull over the side of the road. Had a wife dying in, uh, in the hospital. They said she had one to three years to live. She had a neuroblastoma. They gave her one to three years to live, and I left that hospital that night a broken man. Been married just a very short period of time, six months. And I said, God, you've got to do something. See, up until that time, I had my world all in control. Mm -hmm. Had me a nice 350 motorcycle, motorsport, hill climb. Had me a nice car that I could drive race. And had me, I was drinking the right beer, driving the right car, had the right colored girl. Sit next to me, right colored hair, I should say. Well, I'm there. Okay. Right colored hair, God, okay, but they know. Okay. Had a blonde sitting next to me. Had me a job at Christ, I was working for the big three, making big money. Working overtime in that, but guess what I didn't have? Jesus in me, the hope of glory. He turned the rest of my attention, and I heard, Have faith in God, for verily I see him thee. And whosoever will say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Right. I turned around and I said, Is someone in here? I got home. First thing I said to my father in law, mother in law, and that was this. I said, It's going to be okay. I met with the Lord tonight. How do you go from drinking a beer? on the way to the hospital, to coming home and saying it's going to be okay, the Lord's in this. 
I remember that night getting down on my knees in front of my 12 year old little brother in law, putting my hands on the bed and saying, Oh God. Have faith in God, for verily I stand to thee, that whosoever shall stand in this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. I thank you, Lord, that my wife's going to live and not die. Amen. I want to thank you. Next day, I walked that hospital for six hours. Boy, in Beaumont Hospital, one big like it is now. Walked that hospital for six hours, they couldn't find me. Walking those fields there, those little places around there, saying, have faith in God, the girl that's in the baby. All I knew was that scripture. Nor silver nor gold has obtained my redemption. I had the Blue Cross Blue Shield card in my life. No guarantees. I had some cash in my pocket. No guarantees. Had a job at Chrysler. No guarantees. But I'll tell you what I didn't have up until that time was Jesus in my heart. I'm going to read this passage to you now from Ephesians 1 in the Message Bible. And if you can get a revelation knowledge of this, it'll change your life. How blessed is God and what a blessing He is. He's the Father of our Master Jesus Christ and takes us to the high places of blessing in Him. Long before He laid down earth's foundations, He had you in mind. Had settled on you as the focus of His love to be made whole and holy by His love. Long, long ago, he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. What pleasure he took in planning this. He wants us to enter into the celebration of his lavish gift giving by the hand of his beloved son. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we're a free people. Free of penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds and everything and not just barely free either, abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything he could possibly, we could possibly need. Letting us in on the plans he took such delight in making. He set it all out before us in Christ. A long range plan in which everything would be brought together and summed up in him. Everything in deepest heaven, everything on planet earth. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're really living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us. Say, God's eyes on me. He had designs on us. Say, God's got designs on me. Everybody's looking for a purpose in life. God's got a purpose for him. That's to show forth his glory to this world. Amen. For glorious living, part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. It's in Christ that you, once you heard the truth and believed it, this message of your salvation, you found yourselves home free, signed, sealed, and delivered by the Holy Spirit. Delivered by the Holy Spirit what? To do whatever you want? I, I tire of hearing that passage. I'm a Christian, now I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. No, you're not. You got, when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, you belong to Him. That's yeah. right. Signed, sealed, mm -hmm. and delivered. And now you become a disciple. A disciplined, trained follower of Jesus Christ. This signet from God is the first installment on what's coming. I'm a reminder that we'll get everything that God has planned for us, a praising and glorious life. Why have you started the service by talking about praising? That's what this life is all about. Praise Him. Praise Him in the morning. Praise Him throughout the day. Praise Him when the sun goes down. Praise Him for everything He's given that's why when I heard of the solid trust you have in the Master Jesus and your outpouring of love to all the Christians, I couldn't stop thanking God for you. You know what he's talking about? He's saying each and every one of you is precious, is more precious to him than anything else. You know what's precious to me? Every one of you. Because every one of you, if you realize the, dy the dynamite that you had on the inside of you and how you could transform lives in your family and in your area just because of Christ in you. And you talked about that. You would stop thinking of yourself in, a, in such a, a belittling yourself. You're not a little people. You are mighty people. Yes. Mighty people. Yes. But I do more than think. I ask. I ask the God of our Master Jesus Christ, the God of glory, 
to make you intelligent and discerning in knowing him personally. That your eyes would be focused and clear that, 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 so that you can see exactly what he's calling you to do. That you would be able to grasp the immensity of this glorious way of life he has for Christians. Oh, the utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him. Endless energy and boundless strength. All this energy issues from Christ. All this energy issues from Christ. Now what am I saying this morning? If a motorcycle is worth that much because a rock and roll king rode on it, how much more are you and I worth because a Savior died for us? How much are you and I worth in our families and among the area in which we work because Christ lives in us? When you walk out the doors today, you ought to see yourself in a totally different way. Well, you know, I used to be such, I was so young before, you should have saw me years ago. I often wonder how old we're going to be when we get to heaven. How old would you like to be? Uh, Ron, how would you like to, old would you like to be when we get to heaven? I'd like to be in my 30s. In your 30s, okay. <laughs> Mike, how old would you like to be? 30 sounds good. 30 sounds good, okay. Anybody else? 16. 16? <laughs> Every time I go in, I'll ask the doctor, make me 16 again, he'll say, you're asking for a miracle, buddy, okay? <laughs> it's not going to happen like that. No. But here, here's what I want to be. I want to be on fire for the Lord when I leave this life. I want to still be taking people to heaven. Psalm 71 says they'll bear fruit in their old age. I still want to be bearing fruit when I'm in my 80s, my 90s. I want to be bearing fruit. And I don't mean having children again, okay? <laughs> we, we made the mistake last week of saying we had one of our grandkids. And I said, this is one of our kids. And they looked at us like, I, no, grandkids is what I mean. Okay. <clears throat> no, we don't want to go through that again. <laughs> <laughs> I always uh, like that story where they said, you know, uh, when your children start having kids, that's God's payback. <laughs> <laughs> God is good. Amen. You're a very wealthy person this morning if you're in Christ. If you're not in Christ this morning, and Christ is not in you this morning, you're going to limp along through life. You're going to struggle along through life. You're going to think something is missing, and I'm here to tell you I know what's missing. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm going to ask every head to be bowed, every eye closed. And Bruce, the wife, would come. And uh, if you're here today and you've been looking for a deal, I'm telling you that deal is not in a garage sale. <laughs> that deal is in Christ. Everything you're not, He is. Everything you can't do, He can. Everything you want to be but can't be, He can make you. But you've got to get out of the seat and move to a position where you're in Christ. Now that's you today, just raised by the uplifting hand of hand, say, say, I want that. I want Christ in me, the hope of God. I want that. You begin moving this way. You say, that's me. I want Christ in me. I never forget, I went into prison a number of years ago and they asked me if I would preach. I'll never forget how many men were on their knees in prison. Tears running down their face. And I said, I want you to make this proclamation. My way has not worked. They said, my way has not worked. That's called sin. Can you admit you're a sinner? They said, I'm a sinner. Tears coming down their face. You know, there was a lot. Of, I was thinking about the aunts, the uncles, the mothers, the fathers, grandparents, all the ones that had prayed for them. And they never realized that it was sin that had put them in that position. If you're here today and you have never made a decision for Christ, I want you to raise your hand and say, I'm doing that right now. I'm going to do it. 